Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all to Tabernacle this Sunday after Easter. I hope everybody had a wonderful Easter. I know it started off really wonderful way here at church Easter Sunday. Had a marvelous service. I'm teaching for Carolyn today because she's um, off. She's seeing her great-grandson baptized today. And Joan's not going to be here because she's seeing Evan's girlfriend being baptized today. And so we had four people baptized here last Sunday, and now today at different churches, there's two more people being baptized, being welcomed to the kingdom of God. And I think that is just wonderful. But before I start, I want to start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. We are in your house again this Sunday morning. And it was so marvelous last Sunday that when we celebrated Jesus arising from the grave and the service was wonderful, the music was wonderful. And I thank you that it is a cause for celebration because now we can have eternal life with Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'll help me today with the words that will explain your scripture to the class this morning. And Lord, there's people that need your healing touch. I pray especially for Mike. Lord, he fell and he's hurt and he's hurting all over. And I pray, Lord, not only your healing touch, but that you help him to be remain stable to where he does not fall so very much. We love him and we want him to be healthy and feeling good. So I pray, Lord, that you heal him with your healing touch or with the skill you have given to doctors. Thank you. In Jesus' precious holy word, uh, name, I pray. Amen. You know that the, um, before, when Jesus went to Jerusalem, there was the great outpouring of re uh, rejoicing People putting down the palm branches. The palm branches symbolizes peace. And then they threw down their garments in front of the um, little donkey, the coat that nobody had ever ridden before, because that was a symbol of um, somebody that's really special, like maybe a royalty or maybe a, like a governor or somebody high up. And they did that all on that Palm Sunday. That's why we call it Palm Sunday, because of all the palm branches. And then Jesus had a week between, almost a week, between that Sunday and that Thursday night when he was arrested and taken away for the mock trial that he went through and all the punishment he went through before he was crucified on Friday, Good Friday these days. But this lesson today takes place in somewhere in between that Palm Sunday and the Thursday when they celebrated the Passover meal and then which Jesus then started a new tradition which we call the Lord's Supper. So anyhow, this is something he, taught, he was talking to his disciples about in that time span between coming to Jerusalem and being arrested. And our scripture is taken in from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, starting with the first verse. We'll read three, one, one through three. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now Jesus went out, um, departed from the temple. He was at the temple, and he... <clears throat> Excuse me. And you know that during that time period, uh, he, he drove all the money changers out of the temple because they were conducting 
business there in God's house. And from what I get from reading about it, <clears throat> the um, money changers were not being totally honest. And Jesus called it a den of thieves. It was supposed to be a house of prayer. But anyhow, this, after that, he went out. And I could just imagine, they're walking along, their, their disciples saying, Lord, look at this building. Isn't it wonderful? Look at the, it, the stonework on it, Lord, how they carved this stuff, or how they put all this um, detail on it. Aren't, aren't these buildings wonderful? And Jesus said, you know, don't look at these things. These things aren't going to last. They shall not be remain. And in fact, we know now that um, in about 70, well, less than that, because counting from when Jesus was born as year one in year 70, the Romans came in and totally destroyed the temple. And that's what Jesus was prophesying, that the temple, the temple there was going to be totally destroyed. And not only were they going to destroy the things, but they were going to take the stones that's already been cut for buildings, take them away to use them as sort of more buildings, elsewhere. So he says, you know, there's going to come a day that one stone will not be left on top of the other. And then uh, when he was sitting, he sat down to talk to them on the Mount of Olives somewhere. And the disciples came to him privately and said, uh, could you tell us a little bit more? We want to know more. We want to know when. We want to know a sign. We want to know a sign of these things coming up. But one thing about it is, if we know of a sign, then we don't have a sense of urgency. So Jesus, um, in our next scripture, we're going to touch on that. So before I get ahead of myself, I think I'll just read the next scripture. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and in devious places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, Jesus is saying, pay attention, take heed. That, Take heed, pay attention. Be aware that no man deceive you. Because many are going to come in our name, my name. And we know that there's been many people that I can think in our lifetimes just our lifetimes, that's come, they started out as preachers or something, and their church group got bigger and bigger, and I think the Jim Jones come to mind where he became their, the church, that church body's God. They all went off to Africa, and when he said, okay, the end is coming, so we're going to take our lives, and we and you are going to take the lives of your children. And they said, okay, give me that poison Kool-Aid. Now, we know that that was not of God. That is one of these false teachers coming, saying, I am Christ. And the people fell for it. So we have to be on our guard. We have to be aware. We have to know God's words. So when these people start taking verses out of context to show their point of view, we know that they are not, that they're twisting it, that it is not of God. Wars and rumors of wars. That's going on right this minute. Russia invading the Ukraine, and we saw on the TV this morning a little bit about how the Russians might be thinking about going elsewhere all these other nations the russians want to be a big power they want to be they want these lands so they're they're going out they're in the ukraine now and they may be starting to plan to go to these other nations around the um around ukraine 
There's wars and there's rumors of wars. Pestilence, diseases. We think about that as diseases, as um, a lot of times you see in like the African nations that you have the locusts are going to come, and uh, they have diseases, and you see lots of times the commercials where they want you to give money to the organization to help them, and you see the little children that's got flies on them and things. And we're just horrified because that's not in America, but there's hungry children in America too. But these things are going on, and then we scratch our heads and say, from what I hear in the Bible, what I read in the Bible, Jesus is coming. He's on his way. It won't be long. But I wonder in the last 2,000 years how many times people said that. I know during World War II when Hitler was starting the war and invading all these countries and being so devastating and so destructive and murdering the Jews that people said he's the Antichrist that, okay, the Antichrist is here, Jesus is coming back. But nobody knows. Jesus himself didn't know exactly when the time will be. But there's these signs. But there's one thing here. I'm getting ahead of myself again. But nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Famines, we know... Okay, we are, there's hungry children here in America, and we don't think of this country as being struck by famine. It's just that people sometimes don't have good opportunities, maybe have jobs to work or something. And people sometimes, parents, are taking that money and they're doing, maybe buying drugs, maybe buying and going to buy alcohol, maybe they've got a um, dr uh, gambling addiction or something. They take their money instead of feeding their children to go and maybe play the lottery because they're hurting so much from lack of money. And so they spend it all, you know, 20, 30, 100 dollars on the lottery because it's going to be millions and millions. And you know there's got to be millions and millions of people paying into that lottery to ma generate that money to pay out. And so there's millions and millions of people that's spending that money that could be used for a better purpose. But things, things are getting bad. I, I, I believe that. I believe things are... Is, it, I think it's not going to be long before it comes to a head. Could be two minutes from now, 20 years from now, 200, 2,000. We don't know. God knows. I don't, I don't know if Jesus knows now that he's in heaven sitting at the right-hand side of God. But we know he is coming back when the time is right. And God is the, the one who's going to determine when the time is right. And that's why we don't know, and we have to be ready. We have to try to get people ready. And we have to say, okay, it's, it's looking pretty bad. We, you might better start packing your bags, getting ready. But we, we still don't know, but we need to be prepared. Our next scripture, Matthew chapter 24, 9 through 14. Now, this is Jesus still talking to the disciples about the sign that was going to become up. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive me. And because of iniquity, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. 
I know the, I'm teaching for Carolyn today, but a couple of weeks ago I had the lesson, and Jesus was talking. Now, the time Jesus was talking when, a couple of weeks ago when I had the lesson, it was after, uh, well, it was during the Lord's Supper. He started out by washing the feet of his disciples. And I pointed out that he washed all 12 disciples' feet. And he said then that people will hate them like they hate Jesus. said, hey, they hate me. You better believe they're going to hate you. I am, Jesus didn't say this in the exact words, but it's more like I am the son, the one son, only begotten son of the one true living God. And they hate me. And you better believe if they hate me, the son of God, they're going to hate you. And we're going to come up. We know there, from history that there was families. Um, I think about uh, in England, there was no freedom of religion. And the, it depends on the monarchs of the time in that country and other countries. If the monarch was pro, a Protestant, then the Protestants were okay. But then it flipped. Then it would be a Catholic monarch, a monarch. And then the Protestants would be in danger. Whichever rule, the ruler, whichever way their religion, their, excuse me, religion went, the other was not safe. And then you sit there and go, but we, they both worship the same God. They both recognize Jesus as God's son, but they're against each other. They're fighting each other. They're killing each other. And that's why a lot of the English people, people came here to America in the new country is so they can worship as they, as they were led to worship. And that's still going on today. You think about it today. Here in America, you, we can't worship. Children can't pray in school. There's a lot of times you might get in trouble at work, if uh, one of your um, em, em, fellow employer, um, employees, person you work with, is hurting and needs prayer, and you pray for them, and then you wind up in trouble. And I don't understand that, because we're supposed to have freedom of religion. If we can't pray to our God, where's the freedom? Because the world is taking that freedom away. The, uh, the world view... The worldview, not the God view, but the worldview is not to be holy. And iniquity, sin shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. You think about 50, 60 years ago, how many people was in this auditorium for preaching? I know we're having Sunday school now, but I've seen videos of like... Uh, Vacation Bible school, half the parades, and you'd have two, three dozen children marching in the parade before Vacation Bible school started, so people can know that Tabernacle starting at Vacation Bible school, and the children would likely from other churches come, and you'd have maybe fifty kids, young kids, marching in that, and now. We still have vacation Bible school, but we don't have the parades. And we don't have 50 young children, the school age children, between nursery and youth. We don't have those children like we did. Love of God is waxing cold. And he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, we'll be saved if we uh, accept Jesus' gift of salvation. But because of Jesus, we will endure. Either we die the natural death or Jesus comes back. Whichever way it happens, that'll be the end for us. This, li this, earth, on life <laughs> this life on earth. The flesh life will end. 
but then our eternal life will start. But because of Jesus, we can endure. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. That's what Jesus said when he, just before he rose back to heaven. Go, each nation, go to every nation, every person, people group. I read about in the um, WMU magazine, the Mission Mosaic, about unreached people groups. There's people groups in the millions that have no uh, church there to help them to see the truth. There might be a few believers, but they have no place to gather, to get together, and to uh, fellowship together. And so I think, I, this is Nancy talking. Nancy's been totally wrong so often that sometimes I don't trust myself. But I think that Jesus is not going to come back until all those people groups have the opportunity to accept his salvation. Like I said, that's what I think. I may be totally wrong, and Jesus may be planning to step out right this minute. I don't know. I have to be prepared. Whether he comes in the next 30 seconds or if he comes in the next three centuries, I have to be prepared. All people have to be prepared because we don't know. If we did know, what would we do? Okay, Jesus is going to come. Let's see. Today's the 24th. On about the 26th, he's going to come 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So up until about 2 o'clock of the afternoon of the 26th, I can do what I want. And then I can fall down on my knees and ask the Lord to forgive me. And then when he comes, he has already forgiven me of my sins. Don't have that much time to really show that you tr truly repented of those sins. Now, if you take the time between when you accept salvation and the end of your journey here on life, on earth, if you take that time to truly repent, then we know that that's a, a true salvation. Because like a lot of preachers say, there's a lot of Christians warming pews on church on Sundays that's not truly saved. I know I spent a couple of years like that myself. And I thank Jesus that I saw the light. I realized that I was just what they call playing church, just going through the motions, really didn't like it, didn't want to come. I'd rather go to the Smoky Mountains. I'd rather go just ride around and see the, you know, I didn't want to come to the church. And I sit in the pew and I do fight going to sleep. Made me grumpy. But now, I get to come to church. It's Sunday. It's the Lord's day. I'm in the Lord's house. I'm reading the Lord's word. I'm with the Lord's people. That's wonderful. That's better than the Smoky Mountains. That's better than the beach. To come here and to worship. I just cannot imagine what I would have missed if I went and spent the Easter weekend at the beach or in the mountains. Heaven help me. When that young lady did the interpretation of that song, I, get, I got chili bumps right now just thinking about it. But when it's the song is God saying to Jesus, God didn't say, arise, my son. He said, arise, my son love and that gets to me every time I hear it because God is love and he loves his son and he loves us he loves us so much that he sacrificed his son to a brutal death so that we can be saved and we God's loves can be with him for all eternity. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. You were obedient to the Father.
to the cruel beatings you had, the people mocking you, people deserting you, people that you walked with and talked with and talked and ate with for three years ran away when the danger was so prevalent. They denied you. And then after you rose and they started taking your word out into the world like you commanded them to, all but one died a martyr's death. And John died in exile. He wasn't martyred, but he was taken away from everything that he loved in his hometown. We don't know about his personal life. Did he have wife, children? We know that you... Um, told him to take care of your mother. We don't know, Lord, but he was exiled because of you. And now, Lord, this is getting to be today where your name is not a holy name, but your name is a name to take in vain. Your name is used sometimes as a curse word. And I hate that. People need to know. People need you. But I thank you, Jesus, that I saw the light, that I realized that I was not truly living for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son and giving him up for all believers. And I thank you for Tabernacle Baptist Church. In your name, Jesus, your precious, holy, wonderful name I pray. Amen.